Hi there, and welcome to Alta Asks Live. This is our 26th episode. I realize I start each episode with kind of a shocked reaction at how far this has gone. Um, but I'm delighted to be here for our 26th episode. And thank you so much to everyone who's joined us. Um, I'm Beth Spots with Alta's Digital Editor. We are very excited today to welcome Steve Erickson, author, critic, educator, and science fiction genius. He's, he, if, if it's about science fiction, Steve's going to have an answer, or so I'm promising right now. Um, today, he's going to talk about all things science fiction, especially the genre, as it appears on screens, small and large. Um, you can read Steve's article in our current summer 2020 sci-fi themed issue, um, and you can do so by clicking the green button directly below our faces. Steve is joined in conversation today by Alta Editor-at-Large, Mary Melton. Steve and Mary will chat for about 25 minutes or so, and then we're gonna tackle your questions and comments. Please use the chat feature over to either my right or my left, as well as there's an ask question button below. I'll be monitoring those and be sure to get to as many of those questions as we can at the end. A little bookkeeping before we begin. If you're not already a member of Alta, now is honestly the perfect time to subscribe. We are a quarterly magazine focused on California and the West. Um, maybe you've heard about the LA Press Club Awards, the Eddie and Ozzy Awards. We've, it's, it's literary award season and we've won a couple, more than a couple recently. We're very proud of that. Um, at the end of this month, we're gonna release this, our fall 2020 issue, the theme is noir. Um, and it's a really exciting issue. It's got a, a comic book inside, a pull out comic book. It's pretty exciting. So I do hope that you're able to explore that issue. It'll be up online on September 29th, or you can order at any time. Um, we are most importantly thrilled that you're turning into tuning into this. If you want to find more about Alta, go to altaonline.com, or you can follow our channel here on Crowdcast to stay in touch with events like this. Without any further ado, I'm going to turn this event over to Steve and Mary, and I will be back at the end with your questions. Thank you so much, Beth, for that introduction. And Thanks, Beth. yeah, Steve, it's always good to see you. Thank you for being here with us today. Great to see you, Mary. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I want to just I want to jump right in to the topic because it's kind of top of mind because we just had the Emmys right over the weekend and um, Watchmen did really well. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, that follows a long line of Game of Thrones doing very well in the Emmys and Handmaid's Tale and Westworld has won and been up for lots of Emmys in the last few years. Um, certainly uh, feels like there's a moment right now for science fiction on television, but you write right. in this article how science fiction television is much more complicated than science fiction films because TV is more complicated. I just would right. love to start off with that just very broad idea of what you mean by that. Well, I mean that because, um, because TV can't rely on spectacle, because it doesn't have the money and the special effects. It has to tell stories that involve mm -hmm. complicated characters. Mm -hmm. And so TV writing, at least at its best, is going to be defined. Um, it's gonna be it's gonna be defined more by character and human conflicts and mm -hmm. emotions. It's gonna be character driven as they say in the industry mm -hmm. um and, uh, uh, rather than spectacle driven and and especially when they're telling stories that you know are that unfold over the course of years uh, as a lot of these series do mm -hmm. yeah, is that a more because of the advances in special effects and that that have been made in the last especially five to 10 years, but in the last 20 years, is that a more recent contrast, do you think? Because sci-fi had a presence on television going going back pretty much to the beginning of the days of television, right? And there were, right. there were lots, there were lots, there was lots of great television. So, Twilight Zone, of course, is the first thing that comes to my mind because it's just so brilliant. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, is that is that something that you think has always been the case or is that more more recent? You know, I think, you know, what you said is important to science fiction is having a moment and it's been having a moment 
uh, certainly for the last 10 years and maybe more than that, it was always kind of a disreputable form. Um, and uh, uh, it, it was a genre form. And um, there was a tendency of the culture to look down on genre. And then it began to, uh, you know, it, it began to kind of creep into uh, into other forms. I, I, I'm, I'm not withstanding Beth's very generous introduction. I'm not really the, the, the science fiction genius um, that she uh, uh, called me, but I, I've, I have felt the influence of science fiction. And, you know, as a writer myself, I don't write science fiction per se, but it has definitely seeped into my my work, and I, I I think as that has happened more and more, you know, I think that as it has seeped into the work of, for lack of something better, more literary novelists from Thomas Pynchon to to Margaret Atwood, um, then it, it it's be, it's become more it's become more accepted. Um, and in, in the process, whether whether it's the chicken or the egg or the the cart or the horse, whichever is driving which, science fiction itself has has evolved. It's evolved from a uh, science fiction writing has evolved from a, a a form that was preoccupied with technology mm -hmm. into mm -hmm. something that is more. Uh, more focused on again those human conflicts and emotions as they play out in in the context of technology. So the, that out of the sort of classic science fiction, you know, that was um, uh, um, that was represented by Robert Heinlein or Isaac Asimov or. You started to get writers like Ray Bradbury and Philip K. Dick and Theodore Sturgeon and Ursula Le Guin and Octavia Butler and every one of them is sort of is sort of um, you know expanding the definition of what we'll call science fiction until finally people you know started calling it sometimes something else speculative fiction or slipstream fiction or um, uh, a fabulous uh, uh, fiction, um, and uh, and it, it a, a lot of uh, as, as the form evolved, the acceptance of the form evolved, and as the acceptance evolved, the form responded by evolving further, and and we finally have gotten to a point where, you know. Um, something like Lord of the Rings, which is not really science fiction, which is much more fantasy, mm -hmm. but something like Lord of the Rings can win Oscars mm -hmm. that uh, uh, science fiction movies never, never were even considered for before. You know, 2001 Space Odyssey, which turns up now routinely on lists of the 10 greatest movies ever made, not mm -hmm. just science fiction, but you know, wasn't even nominated for best picture. So, um, the, the 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 culture has has accepted the form, and the form has kind of risen to the challenge. Yeah, so I, I, there's so much to parse to parse in that. And just on a personal note, yeah, I I consider you responsible for my sparking my love of science fiction. I don't know if you know this or not. I feel like maybe I've shared this with you before, but I fact checked a story that you wrote of. About Philip K. Dick for the LA Weekly back when we were both at the LA Weekly and where we first met and started working together. And I, years ago, oh counting. my goodness gracious, okay, amazing. Uh, and I knew, of course, I love Blade Runner, but I didn't know anything about the source material. And I felt right. like what you're saying that science fiction to me was always what the guys who played Dungeons and Dragons read. Like it wasn't what theater kids read. We didn't read science fiction. And it was just ridiculous. Yeah. I read Philip K. Dick and it was it so much depth and character development and, and just the, the whole sense of being 
placed in this world that was just so rich in about what Blade Runner, so much of what Blade Runner is. So do you think that, that two, two questions come out of that. One, what, what do you think was the leap? What do you think made that no longer the thing that the D&D guys read in terms of culture at, at large? Like, it, is, this, is there a larger influence in, to the culture in general that science fiction suddenly found itself in, or, or not suddenly, but evolved into, and, and why, why that? And then secondly, do you feel like not only is science fiction having a moment, but is there a resurgence of interest in some classic science fiction writers now as well? So Philip K. Dick just wasn't as well known, and now right. Man in the High Castle, and so yeah, yeah. have those or have they run on parallel tracks? Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I mean, um, you know, the world is kind of caught up with a certain amount of science fiction in our living experience, and yeah. vice versa. That. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, uh, as you say, it wasn't that long ago, mm -hmm. and maybe some of this is still true, that it was very much a, a fanboy form. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, even though I've never actually taught a seminar on science fiction, I've taught seminars on kind of fringe fiction or, um, you know, outlier fiction. And I, I always like <laughs> pointing out to the the uh, the fanboys that as much as anybody else, science fiction was invented by a teenage girl, and her name was Mary Shelley. And um, uh, oh, 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 for for the first two hundred for for the first half of the two hundred years since, um, uh, you know, it, I think that science, which is to say, through much of the the nineteenth century, science fiction was sort of was sort of in wonder of technology, sort of enthralled by the wonder of technology. Jules Verne would be mm -hmm. the obvious example. And then starting about a hundred years ago, you know, it, it, you know, when fascism and Stalinism were on, on the horizon, science fiction, a certain amount of dread and a certain amount of, of apocalyptic fixation crept into um in into uh science fiction the 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 you know probably the first great science fiction movie fritz lang's metropolis in the 1920s was distinctly dystopian in contrast to a lot of what had come before and then you you know you come to the great demarcation line which is is um august 1945, when the nuclear age begins, and then dread sort of mm -hmm. took over, mm -hmm. over, overwhelmed the sense of wonder. And you had science fiction movies about, you know, mutated, huge radioactive bugs, and, and radiation became this yeah. preoccupation. All of this is to say, Mary, that as 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 we have, have developed, the science fiction has um, has uh, developed with it, and, and, and its its concerns have expanded. You've you've got with 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 somebody like Philip K. Dick, you know, you've got um, you know, it it becomes a much more metaphysical, philosophical fiction of ideas. What is the nature of reality? What is the nature of humanity? What is the nature of God? With somebody like Octavia Butler, we start taking on sociological concerns. Um, uh, so I, I go back to my my original point, which is that the 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 society creates the culture the culture informs the uh the art that comes out of it uh the art reflects uh the society that uh is consuming it and reading it and um and you know i i think we're getting to a point now if we're not already there where science fiction is considered a legitimate form mm -hmm as much as anything else. Mm -hmm. Well, you bring up the apocalypse, so it's hard not to talk about the world that we're living in at this moment in, in that, in that right. context. 
and and you and you discuss that in your essay how uh, the the reading these stories now and thinking about these stories now that we're living through these moments that we could only imagine then or that were only speculative then is a different experience. Have you found that? And this feels like one of those times when, when fiction, when, when true life really does feel stranger than, than, than fiction. Oh, and, right? and suddenly a lot of, and, and not to say that we romanticize the apocalypse, but sometimes I think maybe we did a little bit in science fiction. We, we, I, I think we do, we have, and I'll be honest, um, uh, in my own work, I'm, I'm probably as guilty as anybody of doing that. And, and to a certain extent, I'll, I'll also concede that that's a function of privilege, you know, um, being able to frolic among the apocalyptic rubble of our imaginations, you know, it, it yeah. sounds a lot of fun if you're not, um, you know, a, a little brown kid in a cage on the Texan border, which is a pretty apocalyptic uh, reality. Yeah. And uh, right now, I just, I think that, um, uh, I think that art is having trouble keeping up with uh, with a, a, a reality, and I think that um, uh, you know we watch a series like um, Westworld, for instance, which personally I'm not a huge fan of, but but uh, we we watch it for the ways it, it, it's going to reflect where we're going, and there's a sense that that we've already been if if not in terms of what happens in the story in terms of uh, the spirit of of the story yeah do you see what's happening now affecting the way people are going to be writing tomorrow i mean what what how i think, I think it's got to yeah you know i i i don't i uh, otherwise i think you know and you know it pains me to say this as a novelist i think you know fiction um runs the risk of becoming irrelevant and and, and mm -hmm. I, I don't mean that all all fiction has to become you know socially realistic per se or a literal per se mm -hmm. but um the kind of upheaval that we're seeing that we're seeing now and you know i've been around a while and i haven't seen it before in my lifetime and and if, if, if fiction can't find a way to respond to it, then it just becomes, it becomes escapism. And uh, I, 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 there's nothing wrong with escapism, but uh, art should be something more than that. Steve, you're a, a critic, you're a, a, a novelist, you're a professor. Have you sat down and, and worked your way through what we're going through now at all in words? In the last uh, six months, I, you know, I, not in terms of fiction. I've been keeping a journal. Mm -hmm. um, for is that a unusual while. for you? Have you been doing that? It has, it, or is that something new? It's new. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not something I, I ordinarily do, but I've been doing it for a while, and um, just to kind of keep a, a record for myself. I don't know whether it's it will turn into anything. Later, it kind of depends on how, how this story turns out. But mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, in, in large part because I cannot, you know, m my imagination, w which is considered by some people a pretty good one, can't keep up with, with what is, is going on now. It's, 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 it's too, it's tr too extraordinary, it's too absurd, it's too ominous. Um, and, and yet I, I know that, that, that somehow fiction, TV, film, whatever, poetry, they're, they're gonna have to, to figure out how to grapple with, um, with this, all of this. Yeah, I spoke. You know, from 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 the 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 apocalyptic transformation of the landscape and the climate to the um, the political and social. Yeah, that's. I, I I was just about to say I I, I spoke last week with John Freeman uh, for for All to Ask Live, who has a new anthology out about climate change from writers around mm -hmm. the world, and we spoke a little bit about how 
difficult it can be when you're living through something to read about it. And I feel yeah. like I've heard that from lots of readers and not just about apocalyptic fiction necessarily, but I've heard from lots of friends, like they're having real challenges just reading right now uh, in, right. in anything other than news uh, and, and finding themselves sidetracked constantly with their thoughts and, 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 and worries and concerns. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think it's a good question. And, and f for you is, are there books around science fiction uh, uh, that, uh, and, and fantasy in particular that you feel would be a good thing to read right now that maybe don't kind of feed into those our, our concerns, you know, that can be maybe the, the anti-apocalyptic canon um, that, that come to mind? Wow. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting question. Um, and again, somebody who was more the science science fiction genius that that I am would probably have a, a an answer for that. I you know, I I think that um, I think that uh, somebody like Philip Dick resonates with people because uh, because he he was less in uh, uh, he was less caught up with technological evolution and more caught up with. Um, a, a philosophical mm -hmm. evolution, and even somebody you know like Arthur C. Clarke, uh, who is, is who deals with hard science, but there's a lot of theological stuff that comes mm -hmm. in, into his his work. Mm -hmm. Childhoods and he, of course wrote 2001. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure that that uh, I I don't know how how much the um, I don't know how much the uh, the classic science fiction is going to speak to people now. I, I think probably the, the the science fiction outlaws of the last half century are going to have more resonance um, if if you can find, you know, if you can find a way to uh, to escape into that in into reading. Uh, but I I have to tell you I'm having the same reaction that mm -hmm. uh, you yeah. are and that other people are. I, I'm 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 retreating into history, mm -hmm. but fiction is not is is not is not compelling is not uh, compelling enough for me at the moment, and I I wish that that was untrue, and and I I hope and assume that it is, and I just haven't found found the right thing to read myself. Yeah, I've been reading a lot of historic fiction lately, uh, which which I find is uh, is is actually um, a, 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 ni a nice mix. Still gets me into the fantasy world, but also right. I, I come away learning something from it. Well, let's talk a little bit more about TV and film uh, as yeah. as as an alternative uh, to to literature. Uh, you also yeah. um, were the first person to turn me on to Battlestar Galactica, a show oh, I yeah. never thought the, the second the second version of it, not the not the Richard Hatch uh, or, or, original. Um, and again, like a show in a thousand years, I would never think I would be a fan of Battlestar Galactica. Uh, and I don't know if you've rewatched it at all recently, or or but. Uh, what was so compelling to you about that show? Why do Why do you think it was? Because I, I, if my memory is correct, and I assume this still holds a, sp a place for you as being one of one of your favorite TV shows. Yes, and, and I was exactly like you. I had to have person after person after person tell me, "No, you've got to watch the show." And and after three people whose opinions I really respected convinced me that it was not the the old you know, um, uh, Star Trek light, you right. know, uh, I, I finally, um, I finally, uh, sat down and, and watched it. And, and first of all, I was struck by the, uh, um, the adult nature. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it wasn't, it wasn't star. It's not star Wars. Uh, there is nothing that feels Forgive me, teenagers of the world, but there is nothing that feels especially adolescent about it. Um, these are grown-ups who are living grown-up lives and doing grown-up things. And it also does, um, it, it clearly is, is influenced, as so much else is these days, by uh, the, the, the Dickian concerns of of what is real, and especially the the, the question of what is human, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's for those who who don't know anything about the show, the the the, the human race is 
very briefly has created androids that are in um, revolt. And you know, we have a very clear setup at the, at, at, at the outset between the human beings, the, the good guys, and the androids, the, the bad guys. And then the show starts subverting all of those expectations and starts turning them all on their head and, and mm -hmm. starts examining the nature of humanity. What makes us a human being? Is it really the, the, is it really the, the flesh and blood and bone or can the, uh, the uh, transistors and, 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 and plastic and wiring be just as human if they have memories, if they have feelings, if uh, if they have a um, a sense of something bigger, um, and uh, I, I yeah I recommend the show. If you're resistant, I totally get it. Um, but yeah. uh, I, I think it's one of the half dozen best TV series ever. That's, yeah, that's high from you. That is high praise, um, and so that's something. I, I, yeah, I think we can we can both agree uh, to to recommend as something binge worthy right yeah. now. So, Steve, we're getting some questions, which is no surprise. Um, so, Beth, if you want to hop back on um, and walk us through this, that would be great. Um, thank you, Steve. You may have just saved my marriage because I've refused to watch Battlestar Galactica, um, but I might. I've been convinced now by you to sit next to my husband and you're gonna like it beth i'm not okay. it's not i'm missing the gene too and I, and i loved it okay um steve this is a little kind of unrelated but fun can you recommend anybody obscure i assume we're talking about writers here who have an irreverent or absurdist sense of humor well i mean the, the name that leaps to mind and he's not a current writer He's, he's, he's left us. And I keep expecting he's going to have a Philip K. Dick kind of cult is Theodore Sturgeon, um, who, um, who, whose writing is very uh, subversive. Um, it's politically subversive. It's uh, sexually subversive. Um, and uh, he was, you know, at, at least as much an outlier, I think, as, as Philip Dick was. And uh, so that's a that that's the the guy I would uh, I would recommend Venus plus X or more than human one of those two two novels. St Great. Start I, with those. Okay, I've added a link to um, the person who asked that question. You can check out Theodore Sturgeon on Bookshop.org. Um, Steve, what do you think about Kim Stanley Robinson? whose hard sci-fi works frequently center on ecological themes and living in the yeah. aftermath of a climate crisis. Yeah, well, there are more and more, uh, again, I'm kind of get, getting in over my head here, but there are more and more of the, these writers who have, who have melded the, 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 two, the two concerns, the humanistic and the technological. And Robinson is clearly one. I mean, to, to a certain extent, William Gibson is a one. And, and he clearly was a, is a, a, a you know, a landmark figure in, in, uh, in modern science fiction. So, um, uh, you know, there's a certain amount of hard science to, to um, absorb. Uh, but, you know, if, if you're, left brain and your right brain are on speaking terms, then you can probably manage it. Um, this question is from Renee Saunders, uh, and it's a great question. What is the dividing line between sci-fi and fantasy? Oh, well, I, I, yeah, that is a really good, good question. I, I think the, the, you know, I don't think I'm contradicting everything I've said for for the last 30 minutes, uh, I, I, but I think the the technological component is the uh, is the dividing line. Even if it's not the primary concern, even if it's not taking place in um, the foreground, um, I think that that divides. I think that that technological component, as opposed to a more classically mythic component would would constitute a dividing line and having said that i've just got to add that you know the the 
the as more and more of of, of these forms develop, the, all those dividing lines get bl blurrier and blurrier. Uh, uh, I mean, for for me, um, and this is not a, this is not um, remotely a, a science fiction novel, but I don't think I would have gotten there without having read science fiction. The great Eureka novel for me, as not just a reader, but as an aspiring novelist, was 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez, which is, which is, is full of, which is full of, of what we'll call not fantasy, but fabulism. You know, so fabulism, fantasy, surrealism, speculative, slipstream, science fiction, these are all getting thrown into um, the Cuisinart of culture. And I, I think the more that happens, the better. I love the Cuisinart of culture. <laughs> um, and I love that you're getting through these questions with brevity, where I, we're, we might get to all of them. Oh. Um, Steve, can you elaborate on why you're not a fan of the series Westworld? Is it because you think there's something weak about the show's basic premise drawn from Michael Crichton's movie? Well, I, I never read the Michael Crichton novel and I never saw the, uh, I never saw the movie. I don't, but I think, uh, I, I don't want to, all right, I'm going to answer the uh, question. I'll take what, 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 whatever flack comes from it. I, I, I think that th this is becoming a phenomenon of uh, HBO in general, which is the, that the more successful HBO has gotten, the more it has gotten to be about its production values and its special effects and its stars and its art direction um, and less about the writing. I mean, that that was what, you know, that was what made HBO work back in the days of The Sopranos and The Wire. Um, and, uh, the, the, I, I, f I, I'm not, I'm not, f I don't feel like those characters are, are as fully written as that they could be. God, I'm going to hear from the writer of uh, Westworld, whoever <laughs> he or she is, but I don't, I, I, you know, I just think that, um, uh, uh, there needs to, you know, I would argue that all, all good fiction whatever genre, whether it's noir or science fiction or fantasy or whatever, is always going to be character driven. Uh, you know, and if that sounds traditional, particularly coming from somebody who's not generally considered a very traditional writer, so be it. But it's, it, it's the thing that I tell my students and it's the thing that I would, I would say to uh, you, you know, it, ultimately, whatever form it's taking and whatever structure and whatever fracturing is going on, if the characters aren't aren't compelling you, then it's 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 not working. And I don't find the the characters doing that for me on Westworld. Um. All right, we're going a little bit over, but the questions are still really pouring in. Um, so I'm going to try and keep going here. Can you say something more about magic realism um, and the Latin American writers? Yeah, I, that's a great question because those guys probably influenced me personally as much as anybody did, mm -hmm. along with Philip K. Dick. I mentioned before Garcia Marquez, uh, Borges, you know, um, Labras. Uh, there's a, a, a really good writer named Silvina Ocampo, um, who more people should should know about. Um, uh, you know, even uh, 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 the poetry of Neruda. And they aren't science fiction writers, but they're they're And in fact, they're, they're probably drawing on traditions that predate science fiction. Um, they're drawing on their own uh, uh, traditions. You know, to 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 see to read one hundred years of solitude, to see um, the way that Garcia Marquez could draw on his own fabulism and on Faulkner at the same time and mix them up, and somehow you know makes sense to you know a white boy from the San Fernando Valley. Um, that was that. 
that was again the the, the kind of um, the, the 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 light bulb moment for me, and it was a it was a fiction that that made instinctive sense to me somehow, um, and I I think that in, anybody who's interested in this kind of literature, you know, a lot of the outliers, the people who are not strictly science fiction are are worth uh, reading and the latin americans are are first and foremost really i i i think latin american fiction to a large extent dominated world literature in the you know the second half of the the 20th century uh, the West Coast fires are so alarming. I can't help but think of how geographical time plays out against the built environment in so many of your novels. Can you talk about that hmm. briefly? Yeah, I'll, I'll talk about it a little bit. I, you know, in my what became my first published novel, uh, which was called uh, Days Between Stations, I I was writing what I thought was a love story, and I got to a part in in the novel that I, that I hadn't anticipated. It took place in a, a punk club on the Sunset Boulevard. And then I had this idea to bury LA in a sandstorm. And I remember thinking at the time, well, I can't do that. That's a sort of science fiction-y thing, but I did it. And in the novel, um, the world is kind of in revolt against these, these people who are, playing out their own stories be between them and the, you know Paris freezes over and and um, the canals of Venice dry up and I I wasn't I didn't think I was being prophetic I thought I was just making stuff up you know and uh, um, and 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 now you know reality has kind of, has just kind of this. This is a prime example of, of reality catching up with my imagination. And another novel of mine called Amnesia Scope, you know, Los Angeles is it, it exists within this concentric ring of fire, and um, and 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 that is an example of romanticizing apocalypse. Um, and uh, and and now we seem to be living it and i you know i wrote that novel 30 years ago so uh this is another ex this is what what i mean when i say that i i don't i don't know if my imagination can can keep up with with the real world anymore and 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 it's it's a lot less romantic and it's a lot more frightening especially if if you've got kids um yeah uh, we, we're getting a ton of questions just th that would like your opinions on an array of TV shows, movies, and books, but I'm going to end with one more question um, that's kind of related to your last answer. With fiction not keeping up with reality, have you found any nonfiction works that capture something essential about this era? Capture Putting something essential? Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is a bit of a stretch, but only a bit. Right now, I'm reading a book called The Splendid and the Vile. And it's about um, England in, uh, during the Blitz. And... Uh, Eric Larson. Oh, that's my... This is such a good In book. a way... Pardon me? He, he's, he's a favorite of ours yeah, at all In a way, yeah. it's, it's, um, it's almost... Yeah. It, 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 it's kind of reassuring because there was a country that was really staring down the barrel of it and, um, and managed to, to come through. The difference, of course, is that, the, is that except for a few higher up governmental officials, England was responding as one country and as one people, and they were unified in a way that we are not now. And, and, and our danger comes not from without, but from within. Um, all right, well, with that, I'm gonna wrap up and hopefully people will reach out to you to get your opinion on all sorts of books, movies, and TV shows. Man, they really wanna know what you think. Um, 
in the in, before we we completely wrap up, I do want to let everyone know that Alta has started a really really exciting California Book Club. You can join it for free. If you join, you get a free gift, which is very cool. CaliforniaBookClub.com. I've got a link. That's our direct link. But anyway, cal calbookclub.com, californiabookclub.com. They're all going to redirect to exactly where you want to go. We've got, um, it's led by John Freeman. We've got an exciting panel of book selectors. We've got great partners and we have incredible, incredible books that we'll be reading monthly as we move forward. Um, Mary's been a big, uh, working very, very hard on that. Yeah, sign up for the newsletter for that too. And, and we'll be having all kinds of updates about authors just like Steve, California authors and the works that they have out and interviews with them. So it should be very cool. Um, yeah, so with that, I wanna thank Mary, of course, my friend and colleague. And Steve, thank you so much for um, answering. Thank, these you, thousands of thank you, Mary. Yeah. Um, it's been a delight. If you've, if you've come late to any part of this conversation, I will have it up on altaonline.com later this afternoon. Um, and with that, everyone, thank you. Thank you for tuning in and stay safe. Thanks again, Steve. Bye. Watch Battlestar Galactica. Bye.